In 2009, Michael Jackson handpicked Judith Hill to be his duet partner for This Is It. The two practiced for months until his untimely death. We were reintroduced to the soulful sound during the auditions of NBC's The Voice. Now you can catch her on the big screen in 20 Feet from Stardom, a new documentary that profiles the careers of famous background singers. Joining us now, we have Judith Hill. What's up? Hi. How are you? I'm great. So glad that you're here. Oh, I'm happy to be here. I want to start off with The Voice because that's the most recent thing and they just crowned Miss Danielle Bradbury's winner of The Voice. Yeah. How did it feel being on that show? Oh, it was a blast. I, I had a really great time. Um, the show really allows artists to just blossom and do their thing, their thing on stage, and it's really fun to play with cover songs and make them your own, and the wardrobe department, the music department, all of it, it's just, it's a blast. I know you did a few renditions of your own. What was your favorite uh, remix that you created? <laughs> Ooh, um, in terms of my remix, I think it's either between What a Girl Wants or hashtag That Power. That Power? Uh -huh. That was a really, really crazy one. We actually have pictures of you during that performance, and it was huge. Adam Levine also said that it was <laughs> huge, and watching you perform was like watching a real artist and not a contestant on the show. What was it like? Oh, my gosh. I had such him. a blast. Oh. Um, he's so awesome, and in and, and that particular um, performance, I had such a blast. It was able to really, um, I, I heard the song and I had a vision for it, and I was able to get with the band and come up with this really funky arrangement, just celebrating rhythm and world music and funk, and so um, that was really fun. I'm really glad that was my last kind of performance. And how much creative freedom did he give you, or did he pick some of those songs for you? You know, he picked some songs, but he gave me a lot of creative freedom, which is what made the experience so fulfilling for me. I was able to come in and just have my charts already done, like my arrangement and just give it to the band and they just would play it down. So, I mean, that's really, really special that I had that opportunity and it really allowed me to sh do my like do my thing and be original on that show, which was really important for me. You're obviously very seasoned. I gotta know, was it ever awkward for you getting on stage next to someone that has never stepped foot on a stage before? Um, you know, it was it was fun because everybody's in a different place and we're all like all there for the same reason because we're artists and we love to sing and perform. And so um, I, would, I wouldn't say it was awkward. I think it was more of just like we all grew and learned from each other. I mean, it, the, the people were so diverse, everyone from little Danielle, and just who's never sung on stage before, and you know, to the other season singers and Shamuel Michelle was amazing. Everyone was just great, and we all kind of like fed each other. I know that um, your elimination shocked a lot of people, me included. I had no idea this was coming because from the moment that you stepped on stage, I was like, okay, this girl's gonna win, no doubt about it. And uh, Adam Levine was even shocked. He was caught saying, I hate this country right after you were eliminated. So how, I mean, did you know, did you feel it coming or were you as shocked as we were? Well, you know, it's so funny because like on those shows, anything could happen. and. Every week was like so flex, like you didn't know, like I thought I was going home the first round of lives and when I didn't go home, I was like, wow, okay. So, I, you know, I hadn't, I didn't know what to expect and so it caught me off guard that week because I didn't know if it was going to be, I thought I had a great performance that day before so I was like, okay, I might be okay this week but then, you know, no, I'm not. So, um, it was definitely a whirlwind and, and unexpected, it was like a roller coaster, like yeah. it's just like crazy, like ups and downs with it. Right, because after that performance, we were like, okay, Judith has arrived. It was, well, I am. You had the big hair, the crazy costume, and, um, yeah, pretty shocked that it ended that way. But, I mean, you moved on after that yes. to greener pastures. Yeah. Now you're working on the film tw 20 Feet from Stardom. Yes, it was blessing, um, and it just kind of like amazing how that the timing of that just happened because we worked on 20 feet from stardom was a project that started a couple years ago and um, Morgan Neville the director came up to me and was like you know I'm doing it uh, documenting on background singers and I would love to share your story and I was like oh that's really awesome like nobody's really talked about this subject and so um, I was really honored that he 
chose me to be a part of it. And then I, he finished it about like a couple months before I decided to go on The Voice and I didn't hear from him. And then I decided to sign up for The Voice and he calls me one day shortly before Sundance and he's like, I just finished the film and it's going to Sundance and all this great stuff. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's awesome. I, I, you know, I had no idea and I saw the film and I was completely blown away. And then shortly after that, I went on The Voice. So it's just amazing how it just all kind of came together like that. Just in time. And in the film, you're starring alongside Darlene Love, Mary Clayton, a host of other very powerful women. What's it like being featured next to women like that? Oh my God, I'm just so honored to be in the same sentence with these women. I mean, these women have literally trailblazed and done incredible things. You know their voices, you've heard them on all of these hit records throughout American history, but you may not remember their names or know their names. And so this film is so incredible, incredible because it gives the names behind the voices. And you see the struggle and you see the triumphs of these women. And I mean, like Darlene Love, like she's, has all these hit songs and yet her songs were on the name of another artist. So, I mean, it's just incredible that, you know, this documentary is able to address it and really, you know, celebrate these women and I'm just honored I'm a part of it. We actually have a clip from 20 Feet From Stardom. Let's take a look at it. Working with Michael really did inspire me. And, and saying like, wow, it's okay to dream this big. It's okay to, to realize your dreams. I still believe someday. This last tour, I heard from other friends that were with Michael that he just loved her. And of course she got the job. You know, we were so excited for him and for us to be to able to do this show when it was coming together. And I can't do that. But, but you're fine to do it. I gotta save my voice. And then all of a sudden, we're on our way to rehearsal and we get the news and it's like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, how's that even possible? Such an overwhelming shock just to go from almost on our way to this huge show to all of a sudden, he's gone. You. Your voice is amazing. Every time I hear it, it's crazy. Thank um, you. So you worked alongside the king of pop himself. Mm. How was that for you? Oh, I can't even put it to words. I mean, it was, it was magical. It was, it was beautiful. I, I think that working with Michael inspired me in so many ways that I can't even begin to tell you. I mean, it's like you see a living legend like that standing in front of you, and you had a front row seat every night in rehearsal to greatness mm -hmm. and to this man just making magic on stage. And every, for every cue, the lighting cue, the harmonies, the beat, the dancers, I mean, he was in control of the whole thing and he was like the conductor of this grand orchestra and we were a part of the orchestra. And, and so just working with him, it was just so beautiful. I mean, he's just a sweetheart. He really did love all of us and just sincerely was grateful and it was just humbling. And so I was just blessed to be part of that. We have this comment from Emphatico who says, I've always wanted to see this lady again. She sang beautifully at MJ's funeral. And I think a lot of people noticed you from that memorial service that was broadcast. We didn't know who you were, but we saw this beautiful girl with a beautiful voice. And we're like, who is that girl? I'm pretty sure after the memorial aired, um, the song that you sang was one of the most probably searched terms on the internet. I mean, what happened after that memorial service? Did you get a lot of phone calls? Oh my God, it was a whirlwind after that memorial service. I, something I wasn't even prepared for. And especially, we're, we're like grieving and, and we just did a funeral service. And so after that, a lot of press, a lot of people coming forward and, you know, wanting to talk to me about different things. Um, it, was, it was a crazy time, yes. And so your whole process of working with him, auditioning for him, and being featured as a duet singer with him. I mean, what did that do for your career afterwards? Wow, well, it changed the course of my life. Everything from that point on, it was like, that was the defining moment. And, and really, him, for him to share his stage with me 
did so many things. I, I just can't even, it, it's incredible. It's just even in that short time, not, not only the inspiration, but just people got to really see um, the whole thing with the This Is It movie coming out with the documentary of, of the rehearsal footage. And we didn't know that that was going to be turned into a film. So, I mean, they got to get to see some of the process. And so um, it's a very unique thing. It's bittersweet because it's like birthed out of, a tragic, I mean, this is such a tragic thing, like the King of Pop dying, and I still feel like it was yesterday. Um, so it's it's really like, um, I take away so much from it, but at the same time, it was it was a tragedy. You um, were also in pretty close with his family, too. I saw tweets from you in Paris mm -hmm. um, while you were competing on The Voice, hashtag Team G Judith, OMG. <laughs> and then back when she was going through the tough time um, with the suicide attempt, you sent out your thoughts and prayers to her. Would yeah. you consider yourself pretty close with the family? Oh, man, I, I, I wouldn't say close, close, but I really have a deep affection for them and especially Paris. I mean, my heart broke when I heard about what happened and I can't imagine what she's going through to lose her father and just all of the turmoil since that point on. I mean, my my thoughts and prayers definitely went out to her and I was, you know, really blessed that she reached out on Twitter and she was sort of following me on The Voice. That was really special and I just I just think that um, she's a beautiful girl and I, I hope she's okay. It's in, it's crazy to me that headlines are still coming out about Michael Jackson, even though he's left us for some time now. There's still press clippings after press clippings about you know horrible people saying horrible things. Mm. Still, uh, yeah, I think there was the Wade sad. Robinson thing, uh, and now the testimonies are still continuing. How does that make you feel to see these people still kind of slandering? It's really it makes me sad. I mean. It, it's my, my experience with Michael was so beautiful that, I mean, anything like that just kind of breaks my heart. And, and it's it's not the person I knew, especially, you know, working on stage with him and just the beautiful person, inspiration he is to the world and to me. And so, it, yeah, it saddens me. And I think that um, the This Is It um, area, um, chapter was so special because it reminded people this is the king of pop. The reason why he's Michael Jackson is because he touches people with his music. He really does heal the world with his music. And I think that's what we should remember about him. And that's the biggest gift he's given to the world. And so everything else, the slandering, all of that, that's just, I think it breaks my heart because I think that people should look at what he's done for us and, and really the gift of song, you know. Well said. Well, I want to bring in a few fans of yours that have questions for you. Joining us now in Google Hangout, we have Shaco Lu, a journalist here in Los Angeles, and Philip Lorenzo, an indie filmmaker in San Diego, California. Both huge fans. <laughs> Philip, why don't we start with you? Uh, you know, it's so amazing. First of all, I want to say that um, I remember when um, Judith performed at. Um, a San Diego Asian Film Festival Gala two years ago, and it was remarkable um, seeing her live. And I think my biggest question is, before this is it and after, if Michael would have, if Michael would have lived, how do you think your career would be going now? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I do know we were about to embark on the biggest show biggest comeback show in the history. And so that was going to be incredible, just being on that stage with him. And I have no idea what that would have, I mean, I know that it was gonna be spectacular um, season of my life. And with him being there, you know, great things would have come out of that. And so it, your, your mind can only imagine, you know, um, just how exciting that tour would have been. So, you know, it's a whole nother trajectory that I can't even fathom because um, what happened was so tragic, but um, but yeah, I can only imagine just being on that stage with him and then l finishing the tour and continuing on with my career. I know that during um, a clip in the documentary, you mentioned that it can be like quicksand to be a backup, a backup singer, especially for a huge star like Michael Jackson. You're in his shadow. Um, I mean, do you feel like it's di like extremely difficult to emerge from the shadows and, and break out on your own? Well. 
working with Michael, it's definitely not quicksand. It's right. like the most incredible. I mean, the whole experience of working and singing background is really incredible. You really do learn so much and it inspires you. I think the part that becomes quicksand is when you get comfortable and you start to make you know, you start to make decisions where you put the background singing forefront and then you kind of forget about writing songs, you forget about investing in your show and then you look 10 years down the road and you're like, oh, I haven't done anything for my music and then you've got regrets and so I really wanted to make conscious decisions afterwards to to really focus on the on the music I want to write and I mean, in roughing, even that means roughing it in the, in the tour bus and paying out of my pocket with the bands and being broke. I mean, to me, that that's the struggle of an artist and the journey, but it, it's it's rewarding, and that's you know something you got to pay in order to be a solo artist. I guess at the end of it, anyways, it's all about the story. How about you, Soku? What do you want to ask Judith? Hi, Judith. Hi. Uh, um, it's first of all, you have an amazing voice, especially when you came out of blind audition singing a Christina Aguilera song. Um, you've mentioned that there's a roller coaster experience for you on the voice. Um, I just wonder, like, what surprised you most on that show? What surprised me most? Yeah. What? Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of things. I think that um, the biggest thing that was surprising to me was the schedule. It was very intense. It was like, in the beginning, it was, it was like you had more time to rehearse and work on the song. And then towards, when it gets to live shows, Tuesday night, you, you survive eliminations. That night, you get your song, and you've got to learn it overnight, and you're filming it the next morning. And it becomes so intense, and you've got this crazy schedule, and your head is exploding. And so it becomes very stressful, and I think that that was a very um, grueling process and something that did surprise me. Did all of you get along harmoniously, or was there some explosions happening at each other? <laughs> well, we all banded together as contestants. We were like buddies. We were like the pirates. I, I became really close with Sasha Allen, and we were buddies. And I think that we got in trouble sometimes. We snuck at it. We weren't supposed to. That was another thing that was surprising. We weren't. We were sequestered in a hotel. We weren't allowed to leave the hotel premises for any reasons. My mom couldn't visit me at the hotel. Really? And they took our cars away. Sometimes they took our cell phone away and our computers away. And we were literally on lockdown and so Sasha and I, I d um, might as well gave me the tip. I, we found an underground railroad at the hotel. Oh my goodness. <laughs> a secret escape pl a way to get out of the hotel without the PAs knowing but they would literally be like hiding in bushes making sure all the contestants weren't leaving the hotel. It was crazy. That is crazy. Why is so that? So we got caught a few times and we ended up in the principal's office. It was pretty bad. And what did they say? They just, like, they really got upset at us, and they're like, don't ever leave the hotel ever again. I'm not quite sure what the whole big deal about it was, but it was really intense. Like, I would have demanded an explanation for that. I know. It was, it was crazy, and we were sort of the rebels. Like, I wanted to be Napoleon storming the <laughs> gates, rallying us all up, saying, why do we have to stay at the hotel? But... <laughs> I don't blame you. It, sounds... <laughs> it gets crazy after a couple months of being stuck in one hotel. You kind of go crazy. <laughs> to say the least, I'm yeah. sure. How about you, Philip? Do you have another question? Well, what, what it's always been fascinating about Judith is, you know, this really strong, gorgeous woman, by the way. I'm, I'm not Thank trying you. to say that to hit on you or anything. I'm just saying. Um, how important is your biracial identity, especially in writing your songs and coming up with the instrumentation and your vocals and how that communicates because sometimes it could be organic or sometimes it could be really purposeful. And I just wanted to see how you approach that and how that's influenced your career. Wow, that's it's really influenced me a lot and I've started to notice it even more when I'm writing. Um, I've noticed being like half black and half Japanese, it's always been like about celebrating world music and cultures and, and I think when I write songs, it just naturally tends to become like something where I'm drawing, like if it's African voices or Bulgarian choir sounds, it's just always been a part of me to just ooze world music in, in the pop context. And so um, I just love, like everywhere I go, like I love travel and I love culture so much. So everywhere I go, I feel like I'm picking up bits and pieces, whether I'm in India and I hear like a beautiful harmony or melody, it's just all like a sponge for me. And it's it really does inspire my music. I think that 
um, everything about me is is sort of like this global feeling in my pop in my pop songs, and so um, yeah, it, I think that. Also, growing up in a biracial home, uh, my parents were very open-minded, and the house it was full of musicians from all around the world. My parents, like their friends, were people from South America and Africa, and there would just be the house was full of music, and and I think that that's a big part of why that's something I just de uh, developed naturally. You mentioned working on your own music. What kind of sound can we expect to hear from you? Well, it's definitely, I'm a definitely a soul singer at heart. And so um, I love soulful voice in a pop song. And you'll hear some, a touch of like African feeling maybe in the, in the choir part or in the drums, or you'll hear something funky because I grew up definitely like Sly and the Family Stone was like a community I was in growing up and, and just all of that stuff. So it's really a celebration of soul music in, in, in the world, really. Is there any new music coming up? I'm working in the studio right now, and I'm writing a lot of mu new music, yes. Great. All right, Sh Sako, I think I ruined your name the first time around. <laughs> Do you have another question for Judith? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you, I want to continue the, the previous question by Philip, because we I don't really see there are a lot of, for example, an Asian musician in the Hollywood music scenes. Um, my question will be, how hard is it for you, Judith, like, to build your way up as a biracial musician? Oh, um, as a, it's it's difficult. I think that um, in Hollywood, it's hard being a woman of color and especially mixed when when people aren't really um, familiar with your face or with what you represent. It takes a little bit of them getting used to it, and so you come sometimes you got to spoon feed it to them or gradually um, introduce them to them. I think that the voice that was something I felt. I felt like being on that show. Um, I did feel my ethnicity, and it was very clear, like, okay, this is not straight down the middle. My path has always been, I've sort of been in my own lane. I've never really been entirely, you know, like even growing up, like I would be accepted in the black community or accepted in the, in the Asian community, but not entirely. It was sort of like in the cracks. And so I always felt like um, I've always had that struggle where I've got one foot here and one foot there, and I'm sort of just kind of representing um, so, I mean, being on The Voice, I felt that. I felt like, okay, I'm not really in a, a lane that they can like identify and be like, okay, we know exactly what you are and we're going to put you in this box. So I was constantly like breaking their box and it's like, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to wear my hair like this and the drums are going to sound like this. So they were just like, okay, wow. Like, um, and I think that that's something that I think... Um, is a celebration of just art and culture, and I and I and I love that, and I think that I want to continue in that, and I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. I know it's going to be hard to break new ground, but I think that um, I want to do that, and I want to do it slowly and gradually, so people can get used to it. Great. Well, I think we're going to wrap this up, Philip and Sako. Thank you so much for joining us, Judith. Where can we find out more about your work coming up? Um, definitely follow me on Twitter, Judith underscore hill and is my twitter handle and judithhill.com and judith hill official on facebook and i'll be making announcements i've got some exciting things coming up for the rest of this year some um cool dates of performing and um new projects so definitely keep in posted with me great thank you so much for stopping by and chatting with us oh thanks for having me and thank you guys for tuning in